Let me make sure. Ah, yes, I got it on. Okay, good. Good morning. Glad to see everybody here today. Um, another wonderful Youth Sunday that we get to have today. And uh, with another wonderful Youth Sunday, that means we have a, another fun game we get to play this morning. Um, but before we get into that, um, you know, in youth ministry, you're kind of blessed with two times a year where um, kind of when you get out of youth ministry, it's kind of just one time a year. But youth ministry, you have really two times a year where you can say, hey, New year is beginning today. You know, if you want to start creating new habits, now is a good jumping off point. And those two times are obviously New Year's and then the beginning of the new school year, which I know all the students in here don't want to admit it, but, you know, uh, starting this week, back to school. And all the students are like, ah, and their parents are like, thank goodness. Like, like about time. They're eating us out of house and home. Our electricity bills done gone up like 30%. Like, I, I know some people are excited, although the students might not be. Um, you know, great opportunities to come this school year. Great um, things that God can do in your lives this upcoming school year. And not only for them, but, you know, any time could be a time to start off a new jumping point. So I'd encourage everybody in the church to, you know, jump on board with us youth, um, us, us young folk, um, especially our students today as, you know, we're kind of taking this moment to kind of reorient where we are with God, to rethink about what it means to live our life for Christ and to um, really make changes in our life to set the application for that and to be the Christians God wants us to be. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited for this sermon today. Um, but before we jump into that and before we jump into the game that we got for today, I'd like to pray one more time and um, then we'll get started. So God, I'm just so thankful that we're able to gather here as a congregation today, Lord God. I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for what it means to me, God. Um, I'm thankful for what it means to the community, Lord. I pray, God, that you'll just keep letting our church just be a light to the community, Father. Lord, you help us to keep being the salt of the earth, God, and just um, being a church that is on mission, God, a church that is set to, to reach the lost for you, Father. So Lord, I pray that you'll open up doors for us in that in this upcoming school year, Father. Just um, make a way for us, Father, to, to be able to reach into places we've never been able to reach before, God. That's what we're praying for. Um, God, I just want to pray for the sermon today in particular, Lord. Just, God, I just want to pray for me right now, Lord, that, God, I won't say anything that that you don't want me to say, God, that, Lord, I'll strictly be your mouthpiece today, Lord. Just use me as your vessel today, God, as a, as a tool in your hands, God, to get done what you want to get done, Father. And, Lord, I, shall, I just want to pray for the sermon, Lord, God, and pray for the congregation, Lord. God, I just want to pray that any distractions that might be in the room right now, God, I pray that, I just pray that you'll remove them, God. Lord, help us to focus solely on your word today. Because, Lord, I know that this sermon, Lord, it could, it could change lives today, Father, Lord, because this is coming from you, God. It's coming from your word. Lord, speak today, Lord, and don't let us leave here without being changed. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, I have a, I have a fun little game for us today um, because, obviously, it's like I said, it's Youth Sunday, and I'm a firm believer that games help drive home a point. So anytime that they're going to let me, I'm going I'm to use a game up here because I, I like doing them, and I think they're fun. So here's how it's going to work. You can flip over to the, to the start of the game. So that's the title of the message. Um, I should probably mention that off-brand is the title of the message today. And our game, one more slide. It's called the Guess the Fate Game. So has anybody ever been to the eye doctor before? I mean, I, so if you've been to the eye doctor, just kind of raise your hand. Um, I was blessed to start going to the eye doctor when I was like 12 years old, and progressively my visions got worse. If I didn't have my contacts in, I wouldn't even be able to see Brother Bill or Brother David on the front row, or let alone like read my words that are in front of me. I am super blind. But if you've been to the eye doctor, you know they put the little thing in front of your face, right? And they're like, tell me which one looks better. One or two. One or two? One or two? And you sit there and you're like, flip them back one more time. Flip them back. And, and that's what I normally do. Um, but y'all know how it goes. So that's kind of how this game is going to go today. Here's your part. Or let me explain this. So one of them is going to be an off-brand object, okay? It's going to be a fake. The other one is going to be the actual brand, uh, um, brand name thing. So here's what your job is to do. We're going to flip through them. One, two, one, two, one, two. Um, and if you need to see it again, just say, hey, one more, one more time there, Brother Cayman. And we'll, I'll tell Brother David, and we'll, we'll flip back through them. But after we've seen them a couple times, I'm going to say, hey, who thinks that one is the fake? And if you think one's the fake, you'll raise your hand. And then if you don't, you won't. And then we'll go, who thinks two's the fake? And then you'll raise your hand if you think two's the fake. And then if you get it right, you move on to the next one. But if you don't, you're out, sorry. Um, we're going by honor system. I guess I wouldn't know. There's too many people in here for me to keep count of, but you know who does know? So 
Honesty. Honesty, honesty. Starting off with the first one here, we have a Snickers bar, okay? I'm giving you some toss-ups. So one, two, and one, and two. Anybody else need to see it again? No, okay. So who thinks one is the fake? If you think one's the fake, raise your hand. All right, if you think two is the fake, raise your hand. I'm going to give them a freebie, okay? <laughs> one is, in fact, the fake. Um, Snickers bar is the, is the, actual, is the actual one. Um, so Snickers bar is the real one. The Snickers bar is the fake. I, you see, I want to give you some easy ones up front, but trust me, it's, it's, it's going to get a little difficult here in a second. Um, next, Pringles or Prongles. Um, so Pringles or Prongles. Um, who thinks one's the fake? No takers. No takers. Anybody? Anybody? I don't know. All right. Two? Prongles. Okay. Yes. Obviously, prongles are about another, another easy one right there. Another easy one. So we should get them warmed up. Next. Starbucks coffee or Sunbucks coffee. So Starbucks or Sunbucks. Starbucks. Is Starbucks the fake? Is one the fake? No. What about, what about, what about Sunbucks? Is Sunbucks the fake? The fake, 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 fake. All right, yeah, so Sunbucks, obviously, it's the fake. All right, we're done with the easy ones now. So if you think it's just going to be like that the rest of the time, get ready. Buckle up. Here we go. Next. Here we have an Oreo, maybe? It's a cookie of some kind. I don't know. Next. Or is that one the Oreo? Back, go to one. Is that the Oreo? Or is that one the Oreo? One more time. Does anybody else need to see it again? One, two. Another time. One or two. All right, who thinks one is the fake? Brother Joe, I saw him. <laughs> I'm not letting you slip. Somebody's got to get out at some point. What about two? Who thinks two's the fake? All right, two's the fake. I don't know if you can see. Um, it says Oreo on the number one one, so it's kind of it's kind of hard to see up there a little bit. But Oreo is, yeah. So number one is the real Oreo. Number two is the fake Oreo. All right, it's getting harder. Next, here is a pair of Jordans. Air Jordans is what these are right here. Are these the fake, or are these the fake? Oh, uh huh. Uh -huh. Y'all just thought y'all knew this game, didn't y'all? Uh-huh. Back to one. Oh, sorry, I won't get that loud. Sorry. I might want to bring my game down a little bit. My voice is a little more bassy than Brother Sam's. All right. So one or two. One or two. Anybody need to see it again? All right. Who thinks one is the fake? All right. Who thinks two is the fake? Number one is the fake. It's very minute details. Um, the the uh, logo on this is just a smidge off. It's just a smidge off. If you look at some of the seam work, it's a little off as well. Um, so number one is the fake. See, I, I, I knew it. I, I knew this was going to be the one right here. I knew it. But there's more. So you who are still in the game, we got some more. Next, number one, here's a nice green polo shirt. Is this one the fake or... Is this one the fake? I need you need my glasses? <laughs> I, I, I'll let you borrow my contact lens, but... You need to see the tags? One or two? One or two? All right, who thinks number one is the fake? Who thinks number two is the fake? Number two is the fake polo shirt. All right. Um, so the number one polo shirt, you see the back of it's a little bit longer than the front. That's how polo makes their shirts, okay? A um, little bit longer in the back than in the front to keep it, you know. So, so yeah, so last one, last one, best one. We got, we got a few people in. Um, ladies, you all might know this one better than the guys. Guys. You might, I don't know, you might want to look to your female counterparts to this one, but next. 
We have a Gucci bag. This is a purse, okay? Very expensive purse. Um, is this one the fake? Or, next, is that one the fake? One or two? One or two? All right, who thinks number one is the fake? Who thinks number two is the fake? Number one is the fake, and number two is the real one. So if you made it all the way through and you were able to guess the brand correctly, congratulations. I don't have a prize except you can like go around the church and say, hey, I won. Um, that, there's your reward. You get bragging rights, but um, not too boastful. We don't want to be sinful up in here. Um, we play this for a reason. As, like I said, every game that we always play is for a reason. And, you know, sometimes it is really difficult to tell the difference between the real thing and a counterfeit. You know, obviously some of those earlier ones, pretty easy to tell. I mean... Pringles or Prongles? We, we, we know it's Pringles. You know, Snippers or Snickers. We know it's going to be Snickers all the way through. But as you can see in the last ones, like with those Jordans, with the purse, with the polo shirt, sometimes it is very, very, very difficult to tell which one is the real thing and which ones are the counterfeit. We see it's not just how an object appears that defines its worth and what its standing is, but instead... It's what's on the inside that determines that. It's the quality material of which it is made that determines whether it is the real thing or whether it is a counterfeit or not. And the same is true when it comes to Christianity today. So today we're going to be focusing really kind of more on our local area and we're going to really examine the quality of Christianity within our borders of what's around us today. And this sermon, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you up front, this sermon today may be uncomfortable for some. And it may even make some of you a little bit agitated, a little bit angry, particularly. Um, because as we go through this sermon, you may realize that I'm speaking about someone that you love. Or you may even realize that I'm speaking about you. But the, the purpose of this sermon isn't really to cause discomfort. It's not really to try to anger you, but it's really instead to help identify a real mission field that's been in front of our faces for years. And it's also to encourage us to, be, to live genuine Christian lives. You see, obviously, you know, we live in the Bible Belt, right? Bible Belt, great place to live. Everywhere you look, there's a church somewhere. You know, sometimes churches are so close to each other that you can throw a rock and you can hit the next one down the road. Like, you got that church right there and you got that church right there. You know, Catholic, um, Pentecost, no, what are they, Presbyterian? Yeah, there, there they are. I knew it was one of those P denominations. Um, yeah, so when I'm driving to work every day, I, I drive up Get Well and I go past Broadway Baptist Church and then on my left I have Temple Baptist Church. No, they're not Baptist, they're something else. But their name's Temple, I think. No, is it? No, 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 it's before Get Well. It might be Jeremiah or something. It has a big T on their building. It always throws me off, okay? Um, anyways, you got another church here. You got another church that's like, that another church has taken over. It's now Pathway Church, opening up in September. Then you have Get Well Church. Then you have Gracewood Church. And like, you know, it's like five churches like within like a mile of each other, right? Welcome to the Bible Belt, right? Like Hallmark Bible Belt, churches popping up everywhere. Um, it's a great thing, you know, and the Bible Belt culture really has had many, many, many benefits, you know, and it is because it has allowed a high percentage of people living in this area to become familiar with who Jesus is and to hear the name of Jesus, and it's allowed a lot of people to become to a saving relation, to come into a saving relationship with Jesus because of that exposure. They know they wouldn't have got elsewhere around the world. You know, so so concentrated here, it's hard for us to kind of imagine that there are places around the world where Jesus, you know, they've never heard the name of Jesus before. But with that being said, with all these good benefits that we just talked about, there has been a downside to us living in the Bible Belt. 
because this Bible Belt culture that we live in has really sparked a dangerous endemic that has infected many people that we know and love. And that is really what we're going to be talking about today. Um, you see, this Bible Belt culture has really sparked a rise in what we call cultural Christianity and the cultural Christian phenomenon. And this phenomenon is one that is affecting many congregations across the Bible Belt. And this really begs the question, this is kind of where our jumping off point is going to be here today. What is exactly a cultural Christian? And how did this phenomenon start? And what is the end result of this? And we're going to see there's going to be three really key factors into what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to be pulling this from the scripture. And the first thing, and this is what leads to cultural Christianity. This is what leads to this cultural Christian mindset. And this is what leads to this. It is an off-brand gospel. You see here we read in verse 15, it says, Beware, that's a command, watch out for. So watch out for, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. See, the main culprit that leads to cultural Christianity is an off-brand gospel. This is a gospel that is not focused on Jesus Christ, but gospel that's focused on many, many, many other things opposed to what it is Jesus has done for us. You know, this comes from people who claim to be Christian, who claim to be spokesmen of God, but they are not speaking the words of God at all. Yet, their words are readily accepted by people. And this is what the cultural Christian believes. This false gospel is the doctrine that they live by. And I don't blame them. Because this gospel is a lot easier than what the real gospel is. Because this gospel is full of fluff, for lack of a better word. Um, this gospel, or in this gospel, sin, eh, not really an issue. You know, everybody's a sinner, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, Repentance, you know, if sin's not a big issue, then, you know, repentance, eh, it's kind of an option. Like, if you want to repent, go ahead. Um, Jesus, you know, he was a really good person, you know, somebody we need to look forward to, somebody we need to kind of look to as, like, an example to follow in our lives. But, you know, you don't have to follow everything Jesus did. Um, it's just kind of an option if you want to. And, you know, pursuing holiness, you know, that's for really like the super Christians, you know, like those like really like Bible thumpers, those, those weirdos, those Jesus freaks over there. Like, you know, they're the ones, that, the goody two-shoes that are trying to live their lives, you know, to be like Jesus. Like, you know, that's, that's an option. You know, I can really live my life the way I want to live my life, and God's okay with that. But this gospel's a lie, and it's just, it's just a straight-up lie. That is not true at all. We see in Romans 3.23 it says, For... All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of that sin is death. So because of our sin, we deserve death. That's a big issue. That's a big issue. If I walk out these doors and I go murder somebody, I deserve death because of what I've done. If I lie, tell a little fib to my parents, then... In God's eyes, just as worthy of death. That's how it is. Sin is a big issue. And we see in Proverbs 23, I mean 28, 13, it says, The one who conceals his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses his sin and renounces them will find mercy. In Matthew 3, 8, it says, Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. So if that sin's a big deal, repentance, it's, a, it's an even bigger deal. Us coming clean with God, that's a huge deal. The Bible makes this point over and over and over again. Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God um, yeah, believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one, he believes, he believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with mouth with his mouth, resulting in salvation. John 14, 6 says. I am the, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And any gospel that teaches anything 
other than Jesus as God, living a sinless life, dying for our sins, raising on the third day to save us from our helpless, sinless condition, is not the gospel at all, but a lie from the devil. And anybody that tells you that in order to be saved, you have to do anything other than have faith, repent of your sins, and surrender your life to following Jesus is leading you down a path to hell. But unfortunately, this false gospel, this thing that's been, that's been absorbed, that's been brought into these cultural Christians, that this doctrine that these cultural Christians live by is not this same gospel that I just said. It is indeed a false gospel. It's something that we need to be made very aware of. Because again, Jesus says, beware. We need to watch out for this because this is a huge problem. But not only are all these false teachers and these cultural Christians believing a false gospel, but they're also giving false expectations for what the Christian life is, honestly. You know, they teach that after you're saved, life is easy, right? You know, get Jesus, life is easy, you're going to be blessed, you know, you're going to have all these earthly blessings, you're always going to be financially well, you're going to be able to live in the house you want to live in, work all the jobs you want to work, um, everything with your family is going to be great, everything that you've always lived up to is just going to be peaceful all the time, right? That, that, that's what the Christian life's like, right? No, 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 no. Anybody that's been a, a Christian any amount of time knows that, that that's not the case. It's simply not the case. They say, we all, we know that these are lies, but this is something, I mean, but this is what is being pumped out by these false teachers in the world today. And this is a dangerous teaching that is circulating in our culture today, and we have to be active in fighting against this false teaching, because it is so dangerous. You know, Jesus, he gives two examples in this story right here that he's telling. You see these false prophets there, you know, they come in in sheep's clothing, but they're actual wolves. If you're a shepherd guarding your flock and you see a wolf come in, what are you going to do? You're going you to get it out of there, right? You're not just going to sit around and wait and be like, you know, I see this wolf over here, but I don't know what this wolf is going to do. He could just be coming to have a good time over here with the flock, right? You know, th this could be like the sheep's over here's best friend. He's just going to let the wolf stay there, right? And just kind of let the wolf do his thing, right? No, yes, maybe. No, 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 okay. Yeah, no. The shepherd's going to get him out of there. He's going to run the wolf off. He's going to do what he has to do to get the wolf out of there. Same way we should be with this false teaching. Because this is killing our church today. You also see he gives the example of the tree. You know, good fruit, bad fruit. Good fruit, bad fruit. Good fruit, bad fruit. Good trees produce good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. If you see bad fruit on a tree, it wasn't mean about the tree. You know, we, we read in John chapter 15, you know, God's the gardener. What does he do to trees that don't produce fruit, trees that produce bad fruit? Prunes them. If you're at home, right, and you like got some fruit sitting on the counter, or you like got your fruit sitting in a bowl or whatever, what happens if one of those fruit pieces of fruit goes bad? What's going to happen to the rest of the fruit? The rest of it's going to go bad too, right? It's a chain reaction right after that. Same thing with this false gospel in our church today. It is so dangerous. It is dangerous beyond words. It's really dangerous beyond what I can communicate to you up here today. Because Everything that this gospel stands for, this off-brand gospel is teaching, is completely against the gospel that Jesus teaches. Amen. And we need to be vigilant in guarding against that. See, this watered-down gospel and this watered-down idea of the Christian life paired with a lack of active discipleship in our church today is single-handedly the leading cause of, of the cultural Christian ph phenomenon in our world today. It's just the facts. Because too many people believe this stuff and too many actual Christians don't care enough to put the time in to make sure that the person who just said they were saved is believing the right stuff. And that's something we have to guard against today. So one, I guess it's all up there now. You can see where we're going with this. But an off-brand gospel 
Like I said, it leads to off-brand Christians. So what is an off-brand Christian, per se? What is an off-brand? So an off-brand Christian is a cultural Christian. And a cultural Christian, or cultural Christians are people who've been deceived by this false teaching and are oftentimes in their own lives teaching that false gospel themselves and the ways they live and the, and the things they communicate about Christianity. Because most of the times, these cultural Christians have spent their entire lives in or around church. Going to church, Sundays, Wednesdays, you know, doing all the churchly things, and they've been saturated by all of these things that are Christian, and they've absorbed the lingo and the patterns of Christianity into their life, and it's become their identity. So when you look at them, they look like a Christian. But what are they made of? Just like the game we played earlier. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. And that's why cultural Christianity, this, this endemic that we're seeing in our church today, is so dangerous because it's so hard to spot. Because these people, like I said, they look Christian, they act Christian, they say the right things, they do the right things. They claim to be Christian. They say, yeah, I'm a, you ask them, you say, yes, I'm a Christian. I've been going to such and such church my whole life. My granddad went to this church. My great-grandfather went to this church. My great-great-grandfather founded this church. I'm a Christian. But they're no more saved than someone on the other side of the world who's never heard the name of Jesus before. It's a terrifying thought. We read here in verse 31, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, will enter. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, did we not cast out demons? And in your name, perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's what's on the inside that counts. You're putting your faith in the fact in anything other than what the actual gospel is. If, if your faith is put in that off-brand gospel that we just talked about, your sins are not covered. And our righteousness, you know, Isaiah tells us, it's like filthy rags before God. And there's nothing that we can do on our own. If there was anything that we could do on our own to earn salvation, Jesus wouldn't have had to die, plain and simple. But you see, to the cultural Christian, they are saved because they do the right things. They say the right things. They're not as bad as this person over here. And just like these people that Jesus is talking about here, there's going to be a day when many of these people stand before God and they're going to say these exact same things. They're going to say, God, you know, I helped out with the children's ministry at church, and I, and I went and I helped us with the Calvary Rescue Mission, God, and I, and I like helped put meals together, and I, and I helped, I stayed after church, and I cleaned up, God, and I did all these things for you, God. What, God, what is God going to tell them? Depart from me. I don't know who you are. It's a terrifying thought. If that doesn't scare you, then... I don't know if you're paying attention today, honestly. Because that's something that terrifies me. It scares me down to my core because this is so prevalent today. It is so prevalent. I said, these cultural Christians, like I said, they're like the products that we saw at the opening. They look almost distinguishable, indistinguishable from the real thing. Yet that quality within is lacking. In their lives, they are not producing good fruit. Like, you can see it in some areas of their life where it's like, yeah, like, you know, like when you look at, like, the Gucci purse that was up there, it's like, yeah, like, you look kind of at the middle, you're like, yeah, that, that looks kind of like a Gucci purse right there. But then you start looking around the seams and all the work within, you can start seeing the small details that are wrong. It's the same thing. You can't hide it forever. And they can't hide it forever. Although, they try their best to. But it always comes out. Because, like it says, good trees produce good fruit, and bad trees produce bad fruit. 
no matter how many times you go by the apple tree that's produced in rotten apples and painted over the apples, sometimes it's going to come out. So their actions portray them as Christians, but inwardly they are not producing the fruit in line with righteousness. They're not producing the love, the joy, the peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that we read about in Paul's writings. They're not actively seeking evangelism. Because, again, they're putting their faith in the wrong things. Typically, these are kind of the things that kind of go along with it. They believe going to church makes them right with God. If you believe that today, let me tell you. I heard it said this way before. Y'all probably heard it too, but going to, going to church makes me as much of a Christian as standing in my garage makes me a car, Right? Same thing. Just because you come to church does not mean you're a Christian. You're in the right place. But that does not mean you're right with God. Doing good deeds makes, makes them right with God. Again, like I said earlier, if there was anything we could do in and of ourselves to earn salvation, Jesus would never have had to die. Our good works are nothing before God because God is holy. God is set apart from us and God is so beyond anything that we can imagine that even one single sin, if you only sinned once in your entire life, that is enough to separate you from God for eternity because God is holy and he can have nothing at all to do with sin. They believe being baptized makes them right with God them waters don't, don't change anything. They make you a little wet when you go in, but that's about it. On the inside, there's nothing changed. Yes, baptism is important, and I'm not ever, ever, ever going to knock baptism, but baptism does not save. Baptism, we do, we are baptized because, first off, Jesus commanded us to be baptized, and baptism is a symbol of us dying with Christ and raising into a new life with Him. That's why we're baptized after we have that salvation moment because then we are identifying with Christ. That's why we're not baptized before we're saved because we can't identify with Christ. We're still alive in our sin. We haven't died to our old ways yet. So baptism, very important, but baptism doesn't save anybody. Saying a prayer does not make you right with God either. And that's a common belief. They're like, you know, I said this prayer back and, you know, since then, you know, my life's pretty much been the same and everything. There's no magic words that anybody can say that just makes them right. Do you have to pray to be saved? Yes. Do you have to mean what you say? Yes. And that's where the issue falls most of the time. Most of the time people, you know, they can be pressured into saying the prayer. They can be not fully understand what they're doing, not everything that comes with it. Like I said, in that prayer, if not said correctly with the right heart, with the right attitude, fully understanding what you're doing, it's not saving you either. Plain and simple. These are the things that the cultural Christian puts their trust into. And you see why saves is so dangerous and how it's so easy to just let this slide. And this really is the hardest part for the majority of us right here. Because we sit there, and I'm sure it's already popped in your mind, we all know somebody who fits into this category right here. Every single one of us knows someone who fits into this category. And most of the time, we try to play dumb in our own minds. And we think to ourselves, you know, even though this person is not producing fruits, even though this person over here isn't living godly, even though this person over here has all their faith in the wrong things, you know, I, I do remember a time when they prayed, and I do remember a time they were baptized, and, you know, they come to church every now and then and all that, and all that good stuff, and, we, and we, we lie to ourselves, really, and we tell ourselves, this person, they're okay with God, they're okay with God, they're okay with God. When we know, and they know, and God knows they are not right with Him. 
And you have to come to the tough conclusion, the tough understanding in your own life. And an understanding that is sometimes that this understanding is sometimes won't allow you to sleep at night. But it's an understanding that's crucial to the eternal future of your loved one, this person that you care about. And that is to understand and come to the conclusion that they may be lost. And that you need to actively try to reach them with the real gospel. Which, I'm not going to lie, it's a hard thing to do. How do you convince somebody who thinks they're saved they're not saved? Tough. There's ways to do it. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of patience, takes a lot of investing in that person. A lot of emotional wear on you. A lot of spiritual wear on you. Because your heart's grieving for that person. Sorry. I uh, Me and my mom had a conversation one time about my little brother. And uh, my, brother, my little brother was kind of like me. When he was young, you know, grew up in church, um, just like I did. Did the same things I did, you know, he was baptized, you know, saved when he was young. But his life now is far from God. Actively run away from God, and I've had several conversations with him about it. Me and my mom were talking about it one night. And I told her, you know, tears in my eyes. And I told her, I was like, you know, I don't, I don't know if Kenzie's saved. She was like, why do you think that? And I started pointing out these things in his life. I was like, this, 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 this. I'm like, I'm not here to judge. But I told her, I was like, I would rather spend the rest of my life assuming my little brother's lost and trying to reach him with the gospel than allowing myself to sleep easy at night thinking that he's saved and he's really not and me spend eternity without my little brother. These are the hard things I'm telling you about. Because yes, growing up in the Bible Belt is a great thing. Many of us are in here are products of that. But there are issues, there are people just like my little brother who slip between the cracks, who think they're saved, but they're not. And people assume they're saved because they've grown up in church. And this is a mission field that we need to reach because it's all around us. So we see that an off-brand gospel leads to off-brand Christians, which in turn leads to off-brand churches. Churches that are full of Christians who are not really Christians turn into churches that are not fulfilling their mission. Churches that are not advancing the kingdom. Churches that are not evangelizing the lost. Churches that are not being lights on a hill. Not being the salt of the earth they need to be. Churches that have become, in, that have become distracted. Churches that have become distant. Churches that have become cold. Churches who, that have abandoned their first love. Churches that tolerate sin. Who harbor false teachers. Who are lukewarm in what they believe. And who are spiritually dead inside. This is dangerous. You see these churches turn into what we call country club churches, you know. People just gathering to get together. You see these churches turn into these entertainment churches where it's all about the wow factor and the pop factor. And I'm not, not saying anything against churches like that because I think, you know, those churches are great. But you've got to make sure that your people are saved. You don't have to go far to see there is a huge mission field that needs to be reached right in front of our eyes. One of the first things I noticed when I started, you know, coming here to Temple, what's that sign say when you're driving out onto, onto the road over there? You are now entering the mission field. I want to say also, even within our church today, there might be people in here today who are exactly what I've characterized today. You've put your faith in all the wrong things. 
I just want to tell you today, today's the day you can get it right. Today's the day that you can be saved finally, truly. Because all you got to do, simple, not easy in the slightest, but it's so simple. Faith. Believe that Jesus is who he said he is. Son of God, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, rose from the dead, coming back again. Faith. Live your life with that faith and that belief. Let it guide your actions. Repentance. Acknowledging you're a sinner. Saying, God, I need your help. There's nothing I can do to keep this from happening in my life. I can't stop sinning without your help, God. I don't want this, God. I want you more than I want my sin. That's repentance. And lastly, surrender. God, not my life, but your life now. Not my ways, but your ways, God. Not my ambitions, but yours, God. So my challenge for you today who might have been sitting here thinking, man, this is me. This is me. Make it right today. It doesn't matter if you were baptized in this church. If you find yourself in that church, in that spot today, nobody here will ever think twice about saying anything bad about you. Saying, man, wasn't that person already baptized earlier? Hadn't that person already gone through that? Nobody in here will bat an eye about that. Because what we care about is genuine salvation and genuine conversion and making sure you are absolutely 100% right with God. So that's my challenge for the people who may have found themselves in that boat today. But here's my challenge for the people who know they know they know they are saved already. I've got three challenges. One. Challenge one. (laughs) Confront those you love with the real gospel. It's hard. Like we've already mentioned, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. Those are tough conversations to have. But they're worth it. And they're so vitally important to the eternal destination of that person that you love. And there are things that shouldn't be taken lightly. Some might say, is it really loving to question somebody on something like this? So I say, real love isn't always easy, is it? Real love sometimes requires doing the hard things. And this is one of those things that you've got to do that's hard because you love somebody. You question you ask questions. Find out what they really believe. Ask questions that, you know, that maybe they haven't been asked before. Questions that, you know, it's not your typical Sunday school and just things that they won't really know off the top of their head because if somebody's really a cultural Christian, those are the things that they're going to stumble on. That's when you really find out who they are. So confront those you love with the real gospel. Number two, be genuine in your own Christian walk. In our lives every day, our actions speak a lot louder than the words we say. And we don't want to be teaching anything counterproductive to what Jesus taught with the actions in our lives and the things that we say. We don't want to be those false teachers, false prophets. We don't want to be the wolves who are stumbling blocks for other people. So guard yourselves from that. And then three, lastly, we need to be the church that does God's will. 1 Timothy 2, 3-4 says, This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants or wills everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What's the will of God? Evangelize the lost. Go out, reach these people, teach these people. Easy. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, the first part of it says, For this is God's will, your sanctification. So not only are we reaching the lost, but we're growing in holiness in our own lives. We need to be the church that does these things. Because if we don't do it, who else will? So, as we close today, Joe and them are going to come up here and they're going to play. If you need to pray for somebody, a person that God's put in your heart that you found in this category, altar's open to come pray. Prayer is one of the most powerful things you do. Prayer, you know, God's the one who can change people's hearts. Because many of these people that we know, they have hearts of stone. But God can change that. God can change it. Even when we feel like our words fail, God can change it. Even if you've prayed for years and years and years and years and years for this person, keep praying. Don't give up. And lastly, if you found yourself in that boat today, please, come make it right today. 
the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. So please, don't be fickle with it. All right, Jeff. Sing our invitation, I have decided to follow Jesus.